evangelize, then you disciple. And it doesn't work to do the one without the other. You can't just plant the seeds and the water. Um, our next speaker uh, is the founder of the Center for Cultural Renewal, um, which was founded about 15 years ago. And among the other things that it does, it helps support the kind of direct involvement with uh, mission, with helping with charitable work, which was also mentioned today. Um, she's also a lecturer for the Catherine of Siena Institute, which is a program of the Western Dominican province here in the United States, to help um, basically disciple people, to help build intentional disciples, um, people who are coming to church not because they know they ought to, but because they want to, because they know what it is. Um, people who have been in problem catechized. She's the author of several books, um, including Street Saints, uh, Renewing American Cities, and Equipping the Saints. She's an adjunct member of the faculty at the University of Houston, and she's also a uh, professor at Houston Baptist University, Honors College. Uh, she founded the Works and Faith Connection six years ago, and she's received several awards, among them uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights from President Bush, and uh, the Cornwall Award for Social Entrepreneurship in 2011. So please join me welcoming Dr. Barbara Elliott, who speaks to us today. Stuff. 
stuff and the extreme evangelism and outreach to homeless and all this kind of thing. Yeah. Then on the way back in the United States, some years later, I had a brush with the charismatic uh, movement in the Episcopal Church. And uh, basically, I had to do a yet another turn. Several years later, I met Winston Elliott, who some of you know, who had been an atheist all his life uh, until he met me. He said, interesting woman, but this Christianity stuff, I'm just going to talk around with you. Yeah, little did he know that I had already swung to the other side in terms of belief or non-belief, and I was sure as heck not going to be unequally yoked again. <clears throat> so, he said, well, you can't make me convert. I said, you're absolutely right. I have no intention of trying to convert you. I will pray for you, however, and I'll send you books. So that's what I did. And he said, well, what about our relationship? What about our future? I said, I'm praying for you. Months go by, I get a call, and he is calling me from a Dibbles restaurant in Houston, where he'd been sitting eating his morning bowl of oatmeal, reading a discussion of the life of St. Augustine written by Russell Kirk in his book, The Roots of American Order. And he said, I've been reading this story about St. Augustine, and it's like it's my life. I need to do what he did. I need to repent. I need to convert. I need God. What do I do? And I said, being a good evangelical, well, we can just pray the sinner's prayer. And he said, you can pray on the phone? I said, of course you can. So that's exactly what we did. We prayed on the phone. Turned out he hadn't even been baptized, nor had his children. So in sixteen weeks and months, then he was baptized, they were baptized, and eventually he and I married. When we got married, I said to God, you are the spiritual head of the church. And I said to myself, hang on, this may lead to, you need to buckle your seatbelt here, it might get a little rough. First we were Lutheran, that's where he had been baptized. And I sang a dreadful choir, and he was instantly made the director of men's ministry because he was the first person in the choir if they had one. Eventually he said, this just doesn't seem like it's the whole thing. I said, okay. Next stop was the praise for the assembly of God. He was a friend of his over there. And I said, well, this is going to be interesting. So, there we were, surrounded by all the nations of the world. Houston is very international. And whenever they were singing, we never knew what language they were singing. Because there were so many foreign languages and heavenly languages and everything all at once. The kids thought the music was great. He had some questions about the theology, however. And we had discussions at home like, yes, darling, actually you don't have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. He's going, ah, oh, thank heavens for that. The next stop was a church in Houston's third ward, um, right in the middle of the inner city of Houston. Uh, it was a ministry that both of us had been involved in run by a wonderful man that we both knew well, brought our kids there. Any given Sunday morning, there are 70 African-American teenagers and kids now that, you know, six, seven years old. Two of their grandmothers, one of the white family, and then the African-American pastor and his wife and kids. And we're doing the stomp clap, you know, turn around thing for the words that are projected up on the cracked wall. Yeah, Winston had trouble with the stomp clap turn around. And eventually, as much as we love the kids and love the experience with them of our kids being involved in the inner city, Winston is asking pesky questions about theology again. He said, yeah, it's, it's probably a little thin here. Well, then, then he started exploring Catholicism. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Now you've gone too far. This is not like another flavor of the month. I mean, I did the bounce from Lutheran to the Sinners of God. I'm like, you don't have any idea what you're getting into. I knew these people. <laughs> See, the problem was, I had had all of the discontented Catholics in my Bible studies when I was a evangelical. They didn't know scripture. They were fed up with their church. They were angry with Father so and so. Why would I want to go over to the dark side? <laughs> yeah. Then it got interesting to him because he started doing classes at St. Mary's Seminary. And the interesting thing was, he came home and talk about it. It was actually pretty good stuff. So eventually, I started taking classes as well. Mostly because I didn't want to argue with my beloved husband, I'd rather argue with somebody else. I did. Father 
nasty, he was very gentle with me. Father Barrett still bought me on the head when I got chocolate him. Two of the semesters in, I'm starting to find, duh, God, these Catholics have better answers. This is so annoying. <laughs> I'm arguing my way all the way through it. I am reading and fighting and studying the founding of the church and reading the church fathers. And all of this baggage, you know, what about souls for children? What about soul feeding? What about Mary? All this idolatry. Then I went to Mass. Father Nesky. And my heart had been softened a little bit at this point. I'm reading Scott Hall. And I'm realizing, okay, this is a smart guy who knows his Bible, maybe even better than I do. And he's gone through this, and I'm reading the stories about the patriot and all this kind of thing. And I keep, you know, it's chipping away, but I'm still just butting it against it with my heart head. The Easter trip came, and on the only Thursday, I went to Father Nesty. And I'm watching this gorgeous mass, this procession up to the altar, the washing of the feet, the breaking of the bread, the echoes of the church over all the centuries. And as I am butting my head up against it with reason, something snuck up on me that I totally had not anticipated. Beauty. I was undone by the sheer beauty of it. And as I'm listening to this gorgeous imagery, I'm hearing in my head, heart, the words of Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. Turning and turning and blinding and gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falcon. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And I stopped there, and I heard in my heart, here the center has held. Through all of these centers, despite everything, here the center has held. Tears started coming down my face, and I said, Lord, forgive me for everything I have held against this church. I see that you are here, too. And as I realized that you have always been there, <coughs> I surrendered. We ended up our lady in Wolsey almost by accident. It was the only place that would take us because we had four teenagers and two adults who all wanted to come into the church at one time. Well, that doesn't fit anybody's program. And as we had been rebuffed and we had gone knocking on the door, Father Moore, who happened to be there that afternoon, confidentially said, Of course we could do that. So we did. All of us came into the church almost at the same time. And then, meanwhile, I'm getting to know the Anglican news. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to come to the Catholic Church, and I get to have the liturgy that I love to? Woohoo! Now, I know that's not an Anglican response. That is exactly how I felt at the moment. So, in the years since that time, and we began coming in 1999, I have come to truly love our annual patrimony, this rivulet that was diverted from the main stream, the main river of Catholicism, which rolled through the centuries. And in this little rivulet off to the side, the traditions, the glorious music, the rich liturgy, its majestic English form, had been preserved. And I'm reminded of Joseph and his brothers um, as they sold them into slavery. What they intended for evil, God used for good. What Henry VIII did in renting the church asunder, God used for good in preserving this Anglican patrimony, tucked away an early Protestant niche, hidden from Catholic reforms of the 60s that flattened the majesty of the liturgy, replaced the beautiful hymns with insipid songs and tore down the old traditional architecture to make way for a style that some of us call Spaceship Mary. <laughs> <laughs> now, all these years later, we, the Anglican News, bring our treasures back into the church as our rivulet flows once again into the river of Catholicism that has rolled through all the centuries of time. As I'm teaching my students now at a Baptist university, I have to confess that it's so funny. They are ha they're hiring Catholics deliberately now because we can do the history between the time of Jesus and the time of Luther. <laughs> That's like five of the years for them. They're just kind of like, well, the apostles and oh, by the way, Luther. I seriously had one of those students ask me that. They're just wrapped up with the apostles. So I'm starting to talk about the 
guilty in the church. He says, when's Luther? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, and anyway, so I have the, I have the, the, the pleasure of introducing them to the flyout leaders. We're studying the true, the good, and the beautiful. And as I think about these three transcendentals, um, there is something in the apprehension of them that is almost trinitarian. And it has something to do with the way we approach living our faith. Everything is to some degree true, either more true or less true, more beautiful, less beautiful, more good, less good. Plato and Aristotle and Aquinas all agree that just somehow goodness and beauty are inextricably torn together. More recently, Hans Urs von Balthasar suggests that the three sisters have a relationship that he writes about in the glory of the Lord. He writes, We no longer dare to believe in beauty. Our situation today demands that beauty demands for itself at least as much courage and decision as do truth and goodness. And she will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters without taking them along in an act of mysterious vengeance. He goes on to say, the person who sneers at beauty can no longer pray and will soon no longer be able to love. When we participate in the beautiful liturgy of the Anglican Muse, we are fully immersed in beauty. And we are now reunited with the truth as we have rejoined and have come into full communion with the Catholic Church. And while truth and goodness remain in the church after the form of the 60s, it is evident that beauty has been woefully neglected. What we bring into the church now is a gift for those who have been there before us. But it's not that we're just entitled to rest on our velvet cushions and embroidered mirrors as God's museum pieces. God's frozen chosen. There's a temptation to kind of retreat, uh, to pull back in our own little refuge, uh, particularly for those who have just swung the timer and are still pretty exhausted. We just like to rest. I totally understand that. It is an exhausting journey. But if we truly embrace the fullness of our identity as followers of Christ, if we truly understand we are living in the midst of that trinity of the true, the good, the beautiful, something happens then to us that makes it clear that we are not just receiving this truth of beauty, we have to pour it out into the world. And that's the goodness that I'm going to talk about this evening. This is really, I suppose, a, a plea for those that you can use to think about compassion as the one visible effect of the love which we have been given. The beauty in which we celebrate and the truth that we've discovered theologically, but the visible manifestation of it to the world outside our parishes, I believe, is most compelling, most winsome in the shape of compassion. The new evangelization is urgent. There is a tsunami of secularism that is washing over the world. Europe is now essentially a post-Christian society, and it already was when I left 15 years ago. It's only gotten harder since. Canada is officially a post-Christian society. There are many corners of the world that were once aligned with us and no longer are, and the only places really of Fiber growth in Latin America, Africa, the underground churches in Korea and China. But uh, we're becoming a minority. However, what has happened in this increasing secularization is a polarization, the, the resistance, the, the remnant, the few that are reacting are rising up with a, a renewed sense of purpose to say, this is our reason for being in the world. It is to live our faith. And so bad as this becomes here, the more must we stand, the more must we pour out our love into a world that is so aching and in need. See, Christ has allowed us to participate in his kingdom work among us. And while there are many good things to be done within the parish, many, many good things, that's 
not the whole story. Part of it is also to pour it out outside the parish, into our professional life, into the organizations that we run, or the universities where we teach, or the law firms where we practice law. Heaven forbid, even people who are legislators or television broadcasters. We are supposed to be taking Christ out of the church into the secular world as his apostles, his secular apostles. We pray after receiving the Eucharist that we may do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't think that just means random acts of goodness. I think it means making a commitment, a very specific kind of commitment for each of us as individuals and also as parishes to discern how is it that Christ is asking us to work in specific ways in this community, wherever it is we live. <coughs> it means praying fervently. Here I am, Lord, send me. And it means really being willing to do whatever he says. That's a very scary thing. If you really pray that prayer and mean it, look at it is all I can say. I think there are three particular ways that God is calling the Anglican use to take part in the new evangelization. One is to evangelize ourselves, to deepen our faith. The second is to reach out with compassion to others because of our faith. And the third is to serve as a bridge between the Catholic and the Protestant worlds to share the faith. And let me explain. The first call to evangelize ourselves, to deepen our faith. My experience in speaking in parishes and congregations all across the United States and Canada for the last 15 years has shown me that there are so many people who are regular, faithful church members who are walking around in an adult body with a 13-year-old spirituality because that was the last time they actually thought about their faith was information for confirmation. They haven't gone any deeper than that. And you can still go to church and you can still come on a regular is it doesn't do anything to change that part of you unless you're willing to seek intentional discipleship. If we really do that, if we're really seeking a white hot love of God, the most natural thing then is to have a white hot love of your neighbor. The vertical axis this way, the right relationship to God, has to be primary. But from that then comes the horizontal, the right relationship with our neighbor, the right relationship with that we encounter in our professional lives. They're bound together. And the new evangelism, I believe, is to first discern our own faith and then to figure out what is it we're supposed to do as actual, intentional disciples. But part of the call now for all of you who are priests in this new responsibility of the Catholic Church is to help the laity understand that each one of us is charged with the responsibility to do everything in our power to live our faith with authenticity, with mature faith, to grow up in faith, to not just be a disciple, but to become capable of making disciples. That's what the first call was. That was the first call. That's what Jesus gave us as his marching orders, go and make disciples. And we can't just expect our priests to do it all. The call was for every one of us. Second point, evangelize ourselves, evangelize others. The second call, I believe, is to reach out in compassion because it's irresistible. It's a manifestation of love that simply pours out in the lives of people that we encounter. We're built to be vessels of love. God pours it in, we have to pour it out. He pours in the gifts we share with our others. Part of our mission, part of our reason for being, is to be His hands and feet here on earth. And one of the most compelling things we can do, if we actually give that away to people, it is so convincing, it is so convincing for them, and it's so joy-giving. James writes, if good deeds do not come with faith, it is quite dead. If a brother or sister comes to you and you close with food, and you say to them, keep yourself warm, have a good meal, but you don't do anything about it, we say, not enough. And if we say, yes, keep yourself warm, enjoy our good liturgy, wasn't that lovely? And we don't give them away, James would say that. But you get the point. It's not enough. 
to just celebrate the beauty of what we do. It has to be accompanied by love. So for those of you who think that James is the pistol straw, and you will not be the first, let's talk about Matthew. He's going to stir our stuff. 25th chapter, he describes the last judgment. And he says, the Son of Man will say to those on his left, go away from me. I was hungry, you never gave me food. You never visited me in prison. Depart from me forever. You see, caring for the poor is not an optional part of our faith. And I am not talking about a government solution. I am talking about the part of it that we do. And actually, it's quite central to our Anglican identity. Think about this. Elizabeth Ann Seaton is one of the saints that we can turn to as an example in this regard. She was also part of the Tiger Swimming Team. She converted from the Episcopalian. Actually, I have to say it the way we do in our parish. It's Elizabeth Ann Seaton, whose name relic is here. That's all one word. Elizabeth Ann Seaton's relic is here. <coughs> That's an in-joke for the lady of Wilson. Okay. Um, she was an Episcopalian uh, who, just before the beginning of the 19th century, lived and married at the age of 19. And she went to Italy with her ailing husband um, for his health. And she came back, and she, he got in quarantine. She came back with an incurable desire to become Catholic. Much to the dismay of her very proper and like family. Having become Catholic, she launched an initiative to educate the children of the poor. And there are hospitals and schools bearing her name today. I would suggest that she is worthy of emulation. And for those of us who are honoring our Anglican heritage, perhaps we can think of a way to educate the destitute children among us. I discovered a wonderful program for at-risk kids about 14 years ago called Kids Hope USA. It links one church congregation with one public elementary school, one adult mentor with one at-risk child, who usually start with the first grade if we can get them then, one prayer partner behind the scenes for each of those relationships. You know, the amazing thing is we have discovered that public school walls are prayer permeable. We're not supposed to pray there, but they can't help us from bombarding the place with prayers. And they can notice the changes in the lives of the kids, too. Not only that, but there begins to be a change in the lives of the ministers. These kids, maybe dad's in jail, maybe mom has a drug program problem, maybe both parents are working two or three jobs themselves, maybe they're undocumented, maybe they're married, there are lots and lots of stories. The schools pick the kids. We provide the love. Um, I have to say the last kid, that kid's wife, Catalina, who um, launched our program. I helped to get it up with my name. She's deaf here and has done a heroic thing for all the years since. And I know a number of you soon you have been major to prayer partners. It's an amazing thing. I mean, I slipped into Christopher the War right about the time they were getting ready to build a beautiful church. And I knew you know, the energy of the parish had to be there. I said, when that has happened, what about if we were to give us a gift to the community, our love to the kids who need it? Not because they're Catholic, but because we are. He totally loved the idea, and we've been doing it ever since. Uh, this is our eighth year. And the effect on the mentors is the thing that's even more interesting. We found that people were coming from the back pews who had never volunteered for anything. They didn't want to be mentors. They couldn't sing, they were in the choir, they didn't want to be an usher, they didn't want to teach catechism to kids, but they're terrific mentors, and it's an authentic way for them to live their faith. You get involved in the life of a child, and this is a deliberate relationship. You sign up for one child for an entire year, one school year. You can renew after that if you want. For that one hour a week, every single one of us knows that we are Stepping on holy ground, we are, in a very real sense, the hands and feet of Christ for that child. We may be the only adult who shows up to just love them. And we're doing what Christ asked us to do. We are bringing love to them. I hope to plant about 27 of these partnerships throughout Texas, and gosh, there are now 13,000 kids now all over the United States. Not because of me. They were starting this long before me, but... 
it's a beautiful thing to just spread because so many people of faith just say, this is, this makes perfect sense. It's called Kids Hope USA. Their website is kidshopeusa.org, or you can see me after. It's not hard to do. But I would suggest, what better example is there than those that see that we should emulate in our own backyards to love the kids in our own neighborhoods? It's a powerful witness, not only to the children, but to our own parishioners, to the teachers, to the principals, to the people in their orbit of life. Pretty soon you get to know the neighbors, you get to know the people that are coming to their birthday parties. It's amazing. And we actually know our neighbors in a different sense in our neighborhood now than we ever could have. Even if they don't go to our church, they feel the love that emanates from our church. I believe that that's the kind of thing we're called to do, to simply show our compassion in one-to-one -one relationships. And it's best there, it's so much better than just giving away blankets or clothes or backpacks. Because that's, it's written in the language of love, and that's what lasts for eternity. And it changes all of us. It's mutually uh, transform transformational. Let me look at the third opportunity that I see for Anglican in these parishes. Although you may not feel like doing it now, I believe that we have a unique role as a bridge between Protestants and Catholics. Now, some of you have just made this journey recently, you're thinking, oh, it's the last thing I want to do. I understand. I felt like that too. But just hang on. You may have thought it would burn all the bridges behind you. I thought that way too. And I had been doing ministry with primarily Protestants for quite a number of years, and I was doing exclusively um, lay ministry all over the world. And I thought, they never going to talk to me again. I'm done. Actually, they started coming back to me going, you know, we don't have any Catholics involved in what we're doing. Who could we talk to? Huh? Here I am. It's very interesting. The other thing that we bring to this that almost no one else does in the Catholic Church is that we are multilingual. Okay, now in my case, I can speak in evangelical, okay? I can speak Baptist, not quite as well, you know. I can speak charismatic at least enough that they think I'm really kind of more like them. Um, I can speak Catholic too, but not quite like a native speaker. You see where I'm going with this? We speak different languages in terms of the theology, the way we talk about our faith, the way we live it. To the extent that you are multilingual, multicultural, just theologically speaking, you can be a bridge for people who are seeking an alliance or sometimes curious about how to get from where they are to where you are. Don't rule it out. It's very valuable to bridge the two communities uh, because actually it's multiple communities. And what happens is that once people have a trust with you that you're not just going to bludgeon them on the head with a big copy of catechism, they may find it actually a little easier to think about coming across the bridge themselves without being bludgeoned into it. They just didn't know how before. See, there's a deeper spiritual truth behind all of this. The church was one river of faith that ran throughout all of history, essentially for 15 centuries after Christ. And if you want to start, you know, the clock running as God speaks in the desert and speaks to Abraham, when we look at our, you know, the, the, the depth of the roots in the Israelites and then into Christianity, this is a long, deep river. And it was only a relatively recent phenomenon that broke it into several parallel streams. What happened after the Reformation was unfortunate. If conditions had been different, many of the people who ended up in different, different organizations altogether would have been in a different community within the broader tent of the Catholic Church. People in the Renovare movement, uh, Dallas Miller and Richard Foster, have written about a kind of a mirror Christianity approach to kind of celebrating that which we all share. They've done a pretty good job of it, actually. Um, looking at what the kind of approach
numbers that they've taken, and I've modified it somewhat, but I'll just think about it this way. There are different streams of, of Christianity that are now running through history. One is the evangelical stream, okay, that's the scripture-based and proclamation-based. It's all about the Bible, it's all about preaching. The second one is the contemplative stream. Okay, that's the, the life of prayer and contemplation. And there's a holiness stream, okay, it's about virtue and personal betterment. Then there is the spirit field of life, that's the charismatics and the Pentecostals. It's those who focus on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and all the gifts that come with that. And the fifth one is the stream of essentially social justice, centering on living Christ's commands to better the conditions of the poor. Now, the Catholic Church has members who are in each one of these streams. We have contemplatives, we have the word-based, fewer of them. We have, certainly have the social justice stream. We may have some of the holiness stream. Each of these five streams, if you will, has proponents in the Protestant world that has turned into their almost sole focus. And it can lead to a kind of a narrowing if they don't acknowledge the others. But think about it this way. Anyone else you talk to outside the Catholic Church, they are living in the United States. They have been shaped at least by the culture and the language of one or another of those streams. They speak evangelical, even if they are not necessarily in that church. Or they speak, you know, the language of the contemplative stream. Or they speak the language of the social justice stream. We have an opportunity to approach them by acknowledging that is a legitimate part of faith. And there are Catholics who are fully devoted to that. And even if it's not your own particular favorite focus, we can say with absolute honesty, that is within the broader focus of Catholicism. Come in and see what we have. Let's look at what you have. And the interesting thing is this, we may actually have something to learn from you. I discovered having been on kind of both sides of the aisle, so to speak, there are people who say, you know, we do a pretty darn good job preaching and teaching. We really love the Bible. I'm thinking, you know, you're right. I have sat through a lot of really mediocre preaching. Not about any walls again, but I'm on the road a lot. And I go to a lot of other Catholic parishes, and I'm telling you, it's pretty mediocre out there. They could do with a little dose of evangelical fire and a little bit better knowledge of Scripture. I studied Scripture in the seminary, side by side with our seminarians. And I'm telling you, I know that there is a better way to look at it than just the historical critical approach. I mean, the hermeneutic of suspicion makes for singular, unimpressive qualities. Come on, we can do better than this. Once you get this is before you got to the seminary. I'm sure it's all different now. But when I was there, let me just tell you, it was not. You see, these individual streams, it's like people chose one note to play. They just play the Bible note. You know, they just play the contemplative note. They just play the social justice note. If we can actually get all of the fingers playing all of the notes, you see, they've been practicing these almost in isolation for quite some time, so they're really good at that one note. What if you get all of these really good notes all being played? What if you have a conductor who actually writes the music for them and conducts a whole orchestra of people who have practiced their individual notes? That would approach the music of the spheres. I honestly believe that some of the specialization that has come about in these particular branches of Protestant faith possibly have something we can learn. What they don't have is the overarching big picture. And they don't have the sacraments, or all the sacraments, depending on which ones. But the difference is, if we understand their breath and can convey it to them winsomely, they would feel perhaps comfortable enough to know what is it that actually brings all that together. I'm going to say, I believe we have a holy, god ordained duty to extend the hand back to those on the other side of the tiger to let them know what is so beautiful over here, but to do it by acknowledging what they have, not by emphasizing what they don't have. I reminded the prayer of Jesus the night before his crucifixion as he prayed.
prays for his disciples and he says, Father, may they all be one, just as Father, you are in me and I am in you, so that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that it was you who sent me and that you have loved them as you have loved me. See, I believe that our primary identity is in Christ and as citizens of the kingdom of God and of the Catholic Church. But to the extent that we can be truly living in Christ and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we will be effective in leading people to the source. So let me just talk a moment more on the, on the subject of intentional disciples. See, I, I believe that we really are at a time that we can't just have communities of worship. We should be measuring the capacity of our churches, not by how many we see, but by how many we send. How many people are actually going out into the world and taking Christ with them in all we do? We should be forming in the church as houses of formation, houses of life formation, intentional disciples with a mature faith that equips them to go out into the world as secular apostles, whether they are leading companies and changing the policies of their company because of their faith, because they're putting Catholic social teaching into it, or whether they are writing Hollywood scripts and doing a better job of it, or whether they are making decisions in the boardroom, or whether they are teaching in the universities and actually speaking the truth, whether they are doing whatever their calling is, holy nurses who may give silently praying for some of the patients that they're caring for and asking that they would like prayer. There isn't a profession in the world that is not better if it is not Christ-centered and if it is not done with dignity. So, Problem is, most of the people sitting in the pews have never been challenged to get up and go. I really feel like sometimes my calling is to be a blowtorch, a human blowtorch, like under the pews, you know, to get the pew potatoes up and out and going somewhere else. Pew potatoes are like couch potatoes just go in the church. We need a blowtorch under them with the Holy Spirit to encourage them to go and to put it into, into effect. One way as I was doing lay ministry uh, with outreach to homeless people and drug addicts and people in prisons and a whole variety of things, and writing books about it and speaking about it, I knew Sherry Waddell, who would start the Catholic Sierra Institute about the same length of time I had started with the Center of Cultural Renewal. And she'd been writing about helping people to serve their charisms, their particular gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I had been writing essentially about people who were already using them. And we kind of put our heads together and realized we completed the picture. She understood how to help people discern what their gifts were. And I was already identifying hundreds and hundreds of people who were living their charisms, putting them into a specific kind of application. So we teamed up, and for the last eight years, I have been a road warrior for the Catherine Sin Institute, uh, essentially going into parishes, Catholic parishes, and working with either in care sometimes just with their leadership, sometimes an entire archdiocese like all of Los Angeles, sometimes the seminarians. We did a, a workshop at St. Mary's, we've done in Detroit. We've been all told now over the last 14 years in almost half the dioceses in the nation. They presented at the Angelicum, they have been in Indonesia, they have a whole office in Australia. I mean, it's just taken off and gone. And I think part of the reason is that for whatever reason, that aspect of Catholicism had been underemphasized, whereas it had been overemphasized in the Protestant world, although, gosh, let's see, look at the charisms coming out. Hmm, Pentecost. It's been in the church a long time. So, we tell them how to encourage people to become intentional disciples and how to discern these charisms. Now, just so you know, we're not making this stuff up. First Corinthians 12. Romans 12, Ephesians 4, all the gifts of the spirits are listed out. John Paul II, in Christy Fidel's Lage, he says, the, the church is directed and guided by the Holy Spirit, who lavishes diverse hierarchical and charismatic gifts on all baptized, calling them to be, in each in an individual way, active and co-responsible. He continues, what distinguishes persons is not an increase of dignity, but a special and complementary capacity for service. In other words, 
the charisms equip us to do what God is calling us to do. And they are specific gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we utilize then as we do His work. We have different kinds of workshops that we do in parishes. One is the call and gifted, that's for certain charisms. We have one on making disciples, which essentially teaches people how to present the essential story of who Christ is, how to recognize where people are in the process of coming closer to Him, and then what it is it takes to actually become an intentional subject. And I have a version of the, the charisms that is actually focused on professional life. So what's it look like when you actually take it out in the world? I've been astonished to see this, this outpouring of creativity and determination and efficacy. People who are fueled by the Holy Spirit are supernaturally effective in what they do. And I'm not exaggerating. If you're interested, give us a call. Um, their website is sienna.org, sienna.org, by Catherine Sienna. Once we, once we get a link into our own capabilities, people can step into things that have gone way beyond what they've been doing so far. It's not about just, this is not like a secret plot to get people to do more volunteer work in your parish. Please understand it, it's way bigger than that. It's about mobilizing an army of competent lay apostles who can be deployed to do whatever the Holy Spirit is asking us to do now at this crucial moment, at this crucial moment of need as lay apostles. All we need to do is foster, first of all, awareness of what is it we have as gifts, and second of all, what does God want us to do? What does He want you to do? I asked that question honestly for the first time in 1989. I've done a bunch of stuff in my life before. I worked in the academic world. I worked on Capitol Hill for a think tank. I had served in the White House with President Reagan. I had moved to Germany and married a German baron. Go figure. So I was an American baroness living over there, lobbying with European aristocrats and everyone talking about their yachts and their art collections and their jewelry and their house in the South of France. Yes, we had one too. And I woke up one morning and said, what have you ever done that really matters? What has any lasting significance? And the answer was almost nothing. And I didn't know how to pray very well, but I said, Lord, this is, this is really hard, but I tried it one way, and it didn't yield anything that, that lasts. If you can take this life and make it a witness to you, Please do. And he met me there. He met me there in my vanity and self-centeredness and delusion of what all the material things of the world can mean. It took two years of real discipleship on my part. I studied scripture. I read, I prayed, and was kind of long distance communicating with the, the Falls Church in Virginia. Um, and I just had a I don't know how to describe it. I grew up in faith, and the Holy Spirit met me there and empowered me and changed me in some pretty remarkable ways to the point that I knew who I was and I knew that the new me had to do something a lot different. And when I prayed finally in 1989, I said, okay, Lord, well, <clears throat> two years into this, I'm all prayed up, I'm ready to go. What do you want me to do? He didn't answer my own way. I prayed again. I fasted and prayed this time. I've never done that before. It's in scripture. It's probably a good thing. When the answer came, it was not what I was expecting. The answer was refugees. Now, I'm not in Germany. I'm a television reporter for PBS. My husband is a member of the Buddhist Star. Well, it's just talking about that. He's back in banking. And God is saying, refugees. And I'm going, right. It was a summer of 89. It was before the Berlin Wall came down. And the Hungarians had just snipped the barbed wire on the border. And suddenly 300,000 people had come from Poland and East Germany and Kazakhstan. And they were coming through that one little opening. And they were going to West Germany, which was the only country that would take them. There were suddenly 300,000 people in an already very, very, very full country. 
And God was showing me very specifically, go to the shelters where they are, bring them the things that they need, love them into wholeness, and be a bridge to them with other people who can help. I didn't have a clue how to do it, but I dropped everything else I was doing with one friend, a friend in faith, that's what we did. We went to the shelters. We brought them blankets and baskets of food and pots and pans and coats. We tutored their kids. We found them doctors. I brought family home. They lived with us for a year, and I took this very seriously. We eventually were able to bring other people into our kind of network of helping. People showed up at my door unasked. I didn't advertise anything. They handed me a check and said, you know any Eastern children who need help? I said, I I ever. <laughs> and over the next year, I learned, first of all, the joy of serving, the joy of just loving people unconditionally, without a need even. I mean, I, I tried to be as invisible as possible. My job was to just go and love them and ask them what they needed and help, it, help to provide for them. Eventually, they asked me why I was doing it. And when they did, I told them why, because of my faith. Some of them came to faith themselves, others didn't, but they all knew that they were loved. About a year into this, God, with the same clarity, said, now go tell the stories of my faithful people who stayed in the countries that are now free. And I'm wrestling with God in prayer and saying, I've never written a book for it. I don't know how to do this. I don't speak, you know, Polish and Hungarian and Czech. I mean, I, he was, I had to go. It was just very, very clear. He was saying, go. So he allowed me to find the people who resisted communism because of their faith, who had gone to prison. I talked to the widows of men who had been murdered by the Alexander Yen in Russia, who was the Russian civil service, his widow. I talked to people who had smuggled Bibles and had gone to prison for it. I talked to people who walked out on the streets of East Germany in October of 19. Face down troops, our troops under orders to shoot them. And they just held a small candle and they prayed. God allowed me to be their storyteller. And I was privileged, humbled and privileged to be the vessel for what it was that they had won because of their faith and their courage. When I came back to the United States in 1995, I prayed again. I said, okay, Lord, well, now what? Russia was in America. He said, inner cities in America. And I'm thinking, right, Barbara in the hood. But it was exactly the right thing. And I went and I found his faithful people there. The people who are ministering to the homeless, the people who are going into the prisons and helping them change their hearts so they never go back. The people who are reaching out to the at-risk kids who are actually helping them turn their lives around, even though family structures in this. And God said to me, <clears throat> so far as I can discern, love them, be a bridge for them, be an advocate for them, and strengthen what they're doing. And those that I got to know showed me where to go. I heard their stories, I heard writing about them, I heard speaking, I heard planting models of things that have worked. Did a couple of books and tours through the country, compassion ministry with the working with the White House and trying to tell them, don't silence the source of faith with your federal dollars. You intend to do good, but it has actually another effect. After all that, I came back to Houston several years into it and said, all right, I want to give the gift to my city. What is it? What is it that you want here, Lord? And he showed me one. I didn't kind of Nehemiah march around the wall. And the one place that the wall was down in Houston is employment. If you're getting out of a prison program, and we have several that are really good, and you're trying to get a job and you have seven felonies in your background, yeah, good luck. Or if you've been living in a homeless shelter in the last two years and you're ready to get a job and that's the only address you can get as a star club, yeah, wait for that callback. It was pretty clear that all of these other ministries that I knew very, very well, I've worked with them, I'd spoken on them, written about them. They all end with the implicit goal, okay, now go get a job, but nobody really bridged that because it's not that easy. So I started the Work Faith Connection. 
um, and we transition people through an eight-day job readiness workshop. Not only to get ready to work, but to change their hearts. You know, it isn't just about getting a job; it's about having a whole new life. Whatever you do, if you do it with God's dignity, whatever work you do, it is worth doing if you honor Him with it. But to also then bring people in from the corporate side and say, would you give somebody a second chance if you knew that they had their heart touched by God? Would you give me a second chance? And say, heck yeah. Put on my roof at 100 degrees and put on roofing, you bet. And others would say, not touching money, but maybe doing this. And we built a coalition of business owners who say, no, we'll give them a chance. And in the meantime, now we put together, oh gosh, how many people? And we graduated almost 2,000 people now in six years who then go through three months of job search with a coach, somebody who stays with them for the first full year of employment, and then we help them transition over after that. Of those almost 2,000 people who graduated, and most of them have felonies, 60% have felonies, almost all of them have drug or alcohol abuse in the past, 78% of them today are working despite everything, despite the economy, despite the felonies, despite everything. God can do that. God can actually work miracles. And the most amazing thing for us is to stand back and watch His raw, unfiltered power at work, changing lives. I tell you about all of this because I didn't even choose this. It wasn't even my vision. I just showed up and I just prayed honestly. What is it you want me to do, Lord? And when He nudged me to give direction, it's absurd. And it just wouldn't let it go. And I've learned now that the, the Holy Spirit kind of pounding in my heart is, yeah, it's absurd, but go do it. And then you go, I show up that God does all the heavy lifting. I believe that it's just a question of willingness and being willing to even look a little foolish doing it. Oh, God told me to do this. Yeah, okay, it's not like I have breakfast with God every morning, okay? I, I'm not one of those people. You know those kind of people, right? Really annoying. But sometimes it gives us very clear nudges, and we just have to act on them, and then he does the astonishing things. There are all kinds of resources of things that will help you in your new Anglican parishes, and I'm now Anglican East Parishes, I'm about to wrap up. There are things that you can do in terms of workshops through the Catholic Institute. There are things that can be done in terms of marriage retreats, through a group called The Clearing. I've helped them do marriage retreats for the last five, six years. We found a place, the Jordan Ranch. I'm thinking all of you guys who bring your wives and families along are in kind of a unique, interesting place. Might be a good thing to go on a retreat with maybe five of all of you and your wives to actually talk that through with somebody who can help in the transition. Interesting? See, it's called The Clearing. Um, there are conferences like <coughs> ACT. I don't know if you've been in an ACT retreat, but I can highly recommend it. So Lay Led is kind of an outgrowth of Perseo. Outstanding. It's for stirring up the spirit of an entire congregation. Absolutely done. There are resources for artists. Uh, there's a group on the West Coast, the Greg Wolf Leaves, and they have something with the Glenn Workshop every summer. There are playwrights and novelists and poets and Painters and, and whatever the arts are, they bring them together. That's one of these things called I am International Arts Ministry. There's legatus for business leaders. The list goes on and on and on. I can put you in touch with all of those. Get in touch with me. Barbara.elliot at me.com. And I've got cards up here. The book up here on State Saints. All of this.
And when he returned to his homeland in 1979 as the newly elected pope, he was greeted by millions who filled the streets. And he reminded them who they were. He said, began and began, the phrase that he repeated throughout his entire time as pope, be not afraid. He reminded them they had rights and responsibilities and also obligations that transcended those of his faith. Be not afraid. And eventually, the candles that were lit there spread to those of East Germany and to Czechoslovakia and to Hungary and eventually to the Soviet Union. And at the end of that moral and spiritual detonation, the entire Soviet Union crumbled. I believe it was a moral and a spiritual revolution that preceded the political one. As we live in this increasingly cold, uh, secular culture that is becoming overtly hostile to our faith, we need a spiritual and a moral revolution. When Carol Bortillo put on the red hat, he was reminded that red is symbolic of the blood of martyrs, and thus it has always been. We will be too weak to turn around the direction of our culture unless the church is raising the people who are so serious in their conviction, so in their love, but they are willing to give everything if necessary. They did so in the Eastern Revolution in Poland and in Czechoslovakia and East Germany and Russia. They stood there like candles in the darkness, one here and another and another, and eventually the darkness receded. See, I believe that that's the kind of moral revolution that is necessary here. We have to be living lives with such intensity, with such spiritual beauty and fire that it's a blazing candle in the darkness and it will encourage the, the light of others to be lit from ours and it will also force the darkness to recede. We are up against it now with a government that is increasingly hostile, with public institutions that are increasingly hostile. We have individuals among us who are facing it now, pharmacists who refuse to fill prescriptions for the morning after pill. Business leaders who are refusing to buy the insurance policies mandated by the government. Catholic universities who are insisting that their faith guidelines should guide also their hiring practices. Teachers who dare speak the truth. Adoption agencies that won't place babies in safe sex marriages. And employees who are employers who are trying to help their employees in the midst of a broken immigration system. These are very real, explosive problems in our country now. And I know that the confrontation is getting worse. I have had to cross picket lines to go to a mass in Minnesota, barred by people wearing rainbow sashes who did not want us to receive communion from or receive the Eucharist from that bishop. He had had bouncers next to him as we went up to receive the sacrament. I went back to Minnesota just two weeks ago to speak at the bishop's conference there. Some of the lay people working on his team said that they had been spat upon at the state fair because they were there sitting there with a sign urging people to sign a petition on endorsing traditional marriage. Spat upon. I believe that that kind of confrontation is likely to get worse. I don't wish it so. I simply observe cultural what's taking place around us. God does not want our lukewarm following and endorsing. He wants us to be white hot and courageous. You remember in his letter to, to the believers in Lucia. Yeah, you're lukewarm. I spit you out of my mouth. I don't want him to be sending a letter to the end of you saying, nice liturgy. Great and made over to the Catholic Church, but where's the love? Where's the white hot fire? Where's the compassion? I know that we're better than that, all of us. I believe that we have one hero that we acknowledge in our Lady of Wilson. He's not particularly Anglican, but he's part of our Lady of Saints. Blessed Miguel Pro, who was part of the Cristero movement in Mexico. When Caius had ordered the execution of Mexican priests, Miguel Pro, who was in Belgium, asked to go back. He was finally granted permission. And when he went there, Caius ordered his execution. 
and brought in the international press, thinking that, that Miguel Crow would be begging for his mercy. Instead, Father Crow refused to blindfold, forgave his executioners, stood there fully composed, and looked them in the eye, and as the executioners raised their rifle, he flung out his arms and said, Viva Cristo Rey, and the bullets paled in the image of his life. That kind of witness is what we need to be willing to give. Never to see much, but to be willing. I believe there is nothing less that is worthy. Thomas More made that hard decision. St. John Fisher made that hard decision. That is our anger and heritage. And that is what we need to have ourselves. Viva Christopher. Uh -huh.